there is a word from the Lord and it comes from the book of Isaiah the 40th chapter Isaiah the 40th chapter and I'm going to begin reading at verse 28 and I'm coming from the New Revised Standard Version. It says this, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Verse 30 and 31 again. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait on the Lord, yeah, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto our God. For the time that is ours, I'd like to preach this little message of encouragement. A second wind. A second wind. You may be seated in the presence of our God. A second wind. Sisters and brothers, if you were to ask any trainer, they tell you that it is physically impossible to sprint a marathon. You can take my word on it because for the past month I have been running myself on the treadmill and I'm an expert in the matter. It's, it's, it's physically impossible to sprint a marathon. Uh, sprinters run at full speed with all the power and, and all the strength that they can muster up over a short distance in a limited amount of time. But marathon runners are trained to go farther and longer than the sprinter. The, the marathon's runner's focus is not on how fast they can finish the race, but their focus is on staying in the race until they finish. That's, that, that's, that's the goal of, of the marathon runner. Finish the race. This is why they are trained uh, on endurance, on stamina, on Cardio. In fact, the race uh, is so long and, and so taxing on the body and the mind that in order to finish the race, a runner, a marathon runner, looks for something to take place that will keep them from quitting, that will keep them from bowing out. They're looking for something called a second win. Uh, a second win, family, is, is when a runner gets to a point where they're too tired to finish, when they feel like they can't go on any further, and then suddenly this burst of energy and strength comes along. It renews their confidence and enables them to keep running. Child of the Most High God, we too are in a race. 
Uh, th this Christian journey is not a sprint. It's, it's a marathon. And unless you think that this second wind phenomenon is, is just the experience of 5K runners, I've got some good news for you. Uh, in the times where you're too tired to finish, and when you feel like you can't run any longer, when you feel like the seasons of the stress are too long, in periods of exhaustion, in times where you're too tired from the burdens of this life and we feel overwhelmed, thanks be unto God that there is a second wind available to us to allow us to finish the race strong. Yeah, yeah, it, it allows us to run on, to, to pray on, to, to parent on, to love on, to, to work on. It allows us to take one step at a time so that over time when we look back over the story of our lives, we can say, my God, look where the Lord bought us from. Yeah, yeah. Can I tell you what that second wind is, family? Oh, it's the strength of the almighty God. Yeah, it's his power to uphold us with his righteous right hand so that we don't collapse from the weight of the circumstances. It, it's, it's his ability to keep us when the storms of life are raging and we, and we feel like we won't be able to swim through them. It's the armor we put on so that we can stand against the strategies of the devil. It, it's what Paul rested on when he said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. It, it's, it's what got people through the night seasons of weeping and allowed them to hold on till the morning came. God's strength is our second wind. Uh, so sisters and brothers, um, every one of us will come to a point in this Christian marathon where we get burnt out from running and we need a second win. Every one of us will come to a point in the marathon where it is difficult to keep going and, and everything in you wants to rip that number off your shirt and, and turn it back in to the Lord and say, I, I, I quit. If truth be told, some of y'all are there right now at a point where you feel like uh, you've run out of air. You are tired from grief. You're tired from strife. You're tired from the mistakes. You're tired from, from the disappointment. And you're tired because every time you turn on the news, it's another tragedy. And, and you feel like you don't have another lap in you. That, that's the condition of the people Isaiah is speaking to in our text. They are burnt out. They're exhausted and, and they're in need of a second wind. False prophets told the people of Israel that their Babylonian exile would, would be a sprint. But the true prophecy is that it's actually a 70-year marathon. And, and the Israelites are looking at that thing wondering how in the world are we going to make it the rest of the way. Somebody in this building knows what it is to get into a situation you thought you'd sprint your way through only to find that it was longer than the stretch you went to. Come on, do I have any real folk in the house? You sprinted to the altar of matrimony because you were so in love, but you found out that marriage is a marathon of ups and downs that make you look at your significant other and say, how in the world we going to make it the rest of the way? Some parent ought to shout back at me and, and say, and say parenting is not a sprint it's a marathon of, of training ch children in the way that they should go it's a marathon of heartbreak when they get off the path it's a marathon of weekly prayers that when you drop them off to school they're gonna return home safely it's a marathon 
Yeah, some, some young adult can testify. You sprinted into leaving your family home. As soon as I turn 18, I'm out. I'm out. Only to find that adulting ain't nothing but a marathon of work, bills, and real life. It's a marathon. The Israelites are in a marathon. Um, they are burnt out. They're exhausted. They, they're irritable, and, and they are overwhelmed. They, their outlook on life is bleak, and they're a lap away from calling it quits. Verse 30 says, young people are growing tired and becoming weary. Youths are stumbling and falling. Uh, but then Isaiah offers us a peek into their future. He, he says, I know it's rough right now. I, I know you feel depleted, but, but God sent me to tell you a second wind is coming. Uh, yeah, he, he told me to tell you that he sees the frustration. He, he sees the tears that you've been crying. He, he's seen that you've been slumped over. You're, you're here in body, but you're mentally, emotionally, and spiritually checked out. He, he's heard the concerns you're lifting up, asking God, Lord, how much can one person bear? And he sent me with your prophetic second wind. Here it is. They that weight on the Lord shall renew their strength. They, they shall mount up on wings like eagles and, and they'll run and not get weary. They'll walk and not faint. Israel, he, he sent me with a word to comfort you, a word to encourage you that Israel it won't always be like this. No, no, you're, you're in it, but you're going to come out of it. He says, you're tired now, but you won't be tired forever. Israel, I, I've seen you in your future, and I got to tell you, you, you look better. You, you look stronger. You, you, you're wiser, Israel. And, and I got to tell you that God's got a second win for you. God's got a plan to deliver you, but if you're going to get there, there, you have to wait with hope. That, that's what that word wait means in this passage, to, to keep moving with a mindset that God's going to do what he said he would do eventually. It got quiet because I lost half of y'all right there. Um, how do I hold out for eventually when I'm already exhausted? Um, if you've ever battled with exhaustion and, and burnout, you can testify that waiting for the promise of better is not always easy to do. Um, waiting for eventually while you're hurting and in emotional or physical pain is not always the easiest thing to do. Waiting for eventually to come while on a job that is underpaid and has you overworked is not always an easy thing to do. Waiting while you're lonely is not always an easy thing to do. And if y'all are anything like me, you're asking the question, how do I wait out the while? Well, while... While I'm waiting for the healing, while, while I'm waiting for the breakthrough, while I'm waiting for the answer, while I'm waiting for the restoration preacher, how do I manage the meantime? Uh, that, that's, that's the tension of, of the text. How do I endure the wait? For every person in and here and, and watching online, if you're in need of a second win, Isaiah's got three strategies for us that, that will help us endure until we reach the finish line. 
First, when you're winded, you must remember who God is. Not super deep. Remember who God is. Um, one of the telltale signs that you're experiencing burnout is when you engage in constant complaining. Um, everybody gets on your nerves. The job gets on your nerves. The, the dog, the cat is getting on your nerves. You hate the neighborhood you live in. The car you drive is raggedy. Nobody knows how to drive in the city but you. When every word out of your mouth is a complaint, it's a possible indicator that you, my friend, might be burned out. In Isaiah, the, the, the 40th chapter, the people have brought up a complaint against God. Here it is. It's in verse 27. They, they say, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by him. But I, I think the message translation really captures uh, the heart of this verse. It says, you've lost track of me and you don't care what happens to me. Sisters and brothers, I don't know if you've ever been in that frame of mind, but have you ever felt uncared for by our God? Has it ever seemed like your location tracker on your life was turned off and God couldn't find the coordinates to come and see about you? That that's what the people of Israel are feeling. We are in a situation so bad and, and dealing with an oppressor that's so strong that God himself can't even help us. You y'all might be too churchy to admit it, but but let me go ahead and say it for myself. Sometimes the mountain that I'm facing is so big that that's sometimes what it feels like. That the cancer is it spread too far to, for God to intervene. The, the the marriage is so broken that even God can't put this thing back together. Again, people's value of guns is so greater than life itself that even God can't stop another mass shooting. Inflation is so high that even God himself can't sustain us. And, and as the Israelites view the distance that they still got to run, they come to the conclusion that either God is not capable and he can't do it, or God isn't compassionate and he doesn't care to do it. Ooh, but I love the timing of Isaiah's assignment because right when they start to believe the lie that they're uncared for, right when they start to believe the lie that God can't deliver, God sends Isaiah in with a word. Anybody ever been there where right on, when you were on the verge of believing a lie, the enemy would, had, had slipped in your ear, God said, hold up, wait a minute. No, let me go ahead and cast that down. Anybody ever been there? They, uh, he sends Isaiah a word to set the record straight. It's in verse 28, right after the complaint. Here it is. He's, he says, have you not known? Ha haven't you heard? Uh, the Lord is the everlasting God. The Lord is the everlasting God. That, that word everlasting means eternal. It, it, it encompasses the past, the future, and everything in between it. Says, uh, yes, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, but he's also the God who presently watches over you at night and, and will in the future walk with you 
into wherever you have to go. Yes, he's the God who past tense rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he's also the God who present tense protects us from danger seen and unseen. You need to know the kind of gods you serve. You need to know that you serve a God who's been on the job and, and he's never had a sick day. He's, he's never taken a vacation. He's, he's never clocked out. You serve a God that doesn't back down from an assignment. You serve a God who hadn't met a challenge that he couldn't fix. I hear God saying, maybe you haven't seen my resume, but, but this ain't the first time that I've been presented with a challenge across my desk. This ain't the first time I've, I've had to roll up my sleeves and fight for my people. Ask Elijah about how, what I did to Jezebel. Ask Jehoshaphat the fact how I confused the enemy while they stood still your heart in the first broken heart that I've had to put back together ask David who lost his own his son when he took his first breath ask Job who lost everything in the span of a day no this ain't my first rodeo he says your guilty stains are not the first ones I've had to wash away ask Peter He'll tell you I was ratchet. I was a hot mess. I was lying and cussing people out. Ask Paul. He'll tell you I was a murderer and he washed it away. Hey, God says, check my resume. I, I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I, 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 I'm not new to spiritual wickedness in high places. Y'all getting all in a frenzy about Donald Trump, but I've done this before. Ask what I did to Pharaoh. Ask what I did to Ahab and, and ask what I did to King Herod. Read how it ended for them. Check my resume. Your bills ain't the first ones that I had to cover. Ask the widow with the olive jars and, and she'll tell you about the debt free cancellation plan I put together just for her and she even had money left over. Check my resume. Your medical condition ain't the first one that came across my desk. I'm not confounded by your issue. I'm the God who healed leprosy. I'm, I'm the God who, who opened up blinded eyes. I'm the God who, who restored withered hands and, and straightened legs. Maybe y'all haven't read my resume, but I'm master of everything. I, I never met an attitude that I couldn't adjust. I, I never met a way that I couldn't make straight. I, I never met a mountain that I couldn't move. I never met an addiction that I couldn't break. I never met a prodigal that I couldn't bring back home. I never met a demon that I couldn't put back in his place. I, I never met a dead situation that I couldn't resurrect. I never met an amount that I couldn't pay cash for and then give a tip. I, I've taken care of today. I've taken care of yesterday. And while you're trying to figure out tomorrow, I've already stepped in that thing and worked it out because I am I'm the everlasting God. Check, check my resume. Still on the job. Uh, still on the job. Um, Isaiah says, uh, you, you not only need to be reminded of your God being the everlasting God, but in the same verse, he says, you need to remember that your God is the creator God. Um, it's interesting about that verse is that Isaiah says God is creator of the end. Um, but he's referencing Genesis 1, 1, which talks about creation at the beginning. Uh, friends, why is Isaiah talking about the end of a thing, 
using a scripture that deals with the beginning. At least, don't, don't, don't miss this. Um, Isaiah is letting us know that God never creates anything without having the end already thought out. Yeah, God. He says, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a planner. I, I'm in the details. That's, that's how he could tell Jeremiah before you were ever in your mother's womb. I, I, I knew you. I, I, had a, I had a plan for you. I, I knew who you would be, and, and I knew what I'd have you doing, and I don't know who this is for, but somebody here has found themselves in the middle of a thing. You're in the middle of a heartache. You're in the middle of a financial struggle. You're in the middle of a relationship challenge. You're in the middle of a trauma, and you're worried because you can't see how this is going to end. But God said just because you can't see an ending, doesn't mean there's not one. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't let the middle fool you in the thinking that God is sitting there trying to figure out what he's going to do with your situation. No, God has already worked out your ending in the beginning. He already knew what he was going to do when. In the beginning, yes, he, in the beginning, I created a plan. He says, in the beginning, I knew what opposition you'd face. I knew you'd be in the middle of treatment. I, I knew you'd be in the middle of loneliness. I knew you'd be in the middle of wrestling between two choices. And he says, I have a plan. And in my plan, what the enemy meant for evil. And in my plan... It'll turn around for your good. He says, in my plan, the weapon will form, but it won't prosper. And in my plan, every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned. Paul said, don't trip about the middle because we know that all things yeah, work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his plan. My friends, you need to know that God has a plan and there's nothing strong enough to overtake that plan. You need to tell your worries right now that there's nothing that can overtake the plan. In fact, I hear God saying, you tell your, your worries that the plan still stands and there's th there's not a, anything that can come against it not death nor life not demons nor angels not height nor depth not what's to come or what's been he says there's a plan that I put in motion at the beginning and God says as long as I'm the everlasting God it still stands still stands that's that's, remember who God is. Second, when you're winded and you're waiting, you have to remember that you're human. Remember you're human. Another symptom of burnout is fatigue. I'm not talking a, I need a 30 minute nap to rejuvenate. I, I, I'm talking, a, I, I don't have the mental or physical strength to, to take another step, answer another email, respond to another call, help another person, write another paper, look for another job, get out of bed kind of tired. Um, anybody who has lived any length of time can testify that that these bodies get tired. Th these minds can become drained. Uh, we get worn down from all the challenges that come with this life. Running into family issues. Running into inflation. Running into temptation. Running into disappointment, running into grief. Can anybody testify that they've run into some challenges that have left them physically exhausted? And if I dare be honest, 
sometimes I don't win every challenge. All right, I hear a real section right over here. Um, sometimes the challenges get to be so, so heavy and so much that I stumble and I fall. <sighs> okay. Y'all looking at me real judgy, so let me validate my own struggle in, in, in the scripture. It's, it's in verse 30. It says, even youths will faint and be weary. And young will fall exhausted. But there's a word that starts off this sentence that causes me to pause and take notice. It's the word even. Even. Um, even is an adverb used to emphasize information that would be perceived as surprising are paradoxical. So what is so paradoxically interesting or surprising about youth being exhausted? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, exhaustion isn't a condition that is typically reported as an experience of youth. Maybe y'all grew up like I did, but when I was younger, um, whenever our elders heard us complain about being tired, they'd say, you hadn't lived enough. Y'all must have grown up in Louisiana too, um, to be tired. That's, that's because youth is culturally associated with vibrancy and vitality and limitless energy. But lest you think that your age excludes you from this conversation, youth in verse 30 can also be translated into servant. Which means um, even the spiritual get tired. Even worshipers get weary. Even the prayer warriors get winded. Even leaders become exhausted. Even men break and shed tears. And, and this may come to a shock as a shock to you, but even pastors get fatigued and, and they become susceptible to fainting. This is what a study showed just last year that 38% of pastors considered quitting full-time ministry just within the past year. Sisters and brothers, we live in a world that is fallen with sickness, fallen with depression, fallen with anxiety because it keeps functioning like it has no limitations. But let me tell you, we were not built to be all things to all people. Let me go ahead and take off your superhero cape and give you the room to breathe. We were not meant to be on all the time. Verse 30 says, there is a stumbling and a falling of people nobody would ever suspect. Why? Because they're the strong ones. But Isaiah says, even these will become winded. Now, I understand we, we are not all a monolithic body, not all the same people. And so I dare not put my struggles up on anybody else. Maybe you do run the race always full of energy. Maybe you do run the race and, and you're never brought down low. Maybe you praise your way through every valley. Maybe you've never cried yourself to sleep or, or struggled with trusting God and telling him he's tripping all at the same time. But for the rest of us common folk people who live in a world that 
that can knock the very wind out of you where everything is increasing but the income where it seems like the wicked are winning and the oppressed can't catch a break where it seems like people are leaving this world faster than we can cope with can I take a moment just to speak to your humanity baby it makes sense that you're tired it, it makes sense that you're hurting it it makes sense that in the weakness of your humanity you had a moment where you could care less about tomorrow and you said God I'm ready now just take me now and let's end this thing it it makes sense that in the weakness of your humanity you had a moment that if sis tried you one more time you were gonna let her know what she could do and where she could go it, it makes sense that in the spirit you've made peace that your loved one is with the Lord but in your humanity your heart is heavy and you've got some questions about how God is picking people especially when the ones he seems to be leaving behind are cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Might I free somebody in the house on today who is struggling with the conflict between your spirituality and your humanity? It doesn't mean that you any less saved. It don't mean that you any less anointed. It just means that you're human and you need a little help. It's all right, you're safe here. It's okay to say I'm human. I, I don't dot every I. I, I don't cross every T. I don't say everything I'm supposed to have. I'm human. That's why um, I can't afford to lean on my own understanding because I'm human. That's why I, I can't afford to put my trust in people because they're human and their strength is like mine is limited their patience is like mine is limited their understanding is like mine it's limited. I know that you're the one that everybody comes to when they need a word. I know that you're the one that everybody comes to, to to lay hands on them and pray. But let me remind you, you're still human. Yeah, I know that you're blessed and highly favored, too anointed to be disappointed, too, str too blessed to be stressed, too high to be low. But let me tell you, baby, you're still human. I know you have more degrees than a thermometer, but let me remind you, you're still human. And in your humanity, you need some help. Uh, it's important that you are honest about your humanity. Hear this. So you know where your weaknesses are. So you know where you have the tendency to faint. Um, because when you're tired, you run the risk of tripping over stuff that you would easily be able to walk around if you were fully alert. Oh, do I have any witnesses in the house uh, who can be honest and say everybody has something or somebody that they can look back on and say, oh, that happened in my tired season. That, that I dated him or her in my tired. See, I picked that up in my tired season. That's how some of us end up making some foolish decisions because we were tired from waiting on God. So we did it in our own and we messed around and had something that we don't want that's tiring us because we picked them in our time. The flesh gets tired. Uh, yeah, I, I know your hands look new and your feet did too, but don't get it stuck. Don't get it twisted. You still have some weaknesses that can trip you up. But here's the conviction in the text because I don't want pastor to come back next week and y'all said, Minister Cynthia said we can live any kind of way because we're human. Okay. Devil is a lie. Don't, don't. He'll never put me back up here. Don't. Um. While Isaiah acknowledges their humanity, 
he never encourages them to live there. Um, text says, even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But here is the ship. Those, y'all hear the distinction? Those, the ones who wait for the Lord, the ones who make the decision to believe that eventually God's going to do what he said he do. Those are the ones whose strengths will be renewed. Oh, yes, we are all human. And yes, we all get weary from well-doing. But what distinguishes the worshiper from the world is the way we deal with our humanity. We don't settle there because we understand that our humanity is not a license to live intentionally raggedy. Um, it, it's not an excuse to bypass the truth of how we should be living. And can I pause right here and share my concern for the world? Um, because we're living in a time where the weaknesses of our humanity are being used as a crutch to live any kind of way and, and do any kind of thing and, and say any kind of old thing because, uh, uh, because we're human. But really, it should be the very thing that makes us take the posture of Isaiah in chapter 6 after he looked up and saw the holiness of our God, it ought to make you cry out from the depths of your soul, woe is me, for I am a human of unclean lips amongst a whole bunch of humans with unclean lips. Can I tell you what the problem is? The problem is that ain't nobody crying out. We just accepted, this is my truth, this is my truth, this is my, this the way I am, this is what. And nobody's coming to the altar. No, nobody's laying down before the Lord and say, God, it's me. It's me with the issues. It's me with the problems. And, and I'm coming to you in need of help. I came to tell you, don't you let the church pressure you into keeping you from acknowledging your humanity. But at the same time, don't you let the world and the ways of the world lead you to believe it's okay to stay in it. Because my Bible says, be not conformed. I wish I had somebody in here to the ways of this world but be ye okay I got some Bible readers be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind yes yes you better learn that it's all right to say I'm human but you gotta learn how to make a shift yeah you gotta learn that yes I had a moment of weakness but I can't stay here no no yes I stumbled over that temptation but I can't stay that yes we're human but you better learn how to make a quick shift I hear the, the, the Apostle Paul saying from that great angelic stadium, lay aside every, every weight that so easily besets you, every weight that so easily gets you down, every weight that so easily drains you and, and keeps you from being in the holiness of God. And every now and then you ought to find yourself taking inventory of, of what's going on inside you and, and you ought to lay it aside. Every now and then you ought to find yourself saying, God, I need your help. I, I can't run like this. I, I need your help. I, I can't run with this anger I, I need to lay it aside I, I can't run with this lust Lord I need you to lay it aside I can't run with this addiction God I need to lay it aside I can't run with this mindset I, I need to lay it aside you can't lay it aside if you keep cuddling with it
if you keep making excuses for it. God says, if you want to go farther, if, if you want to stay in the race longer, it's some stuff you got to lay aside. It's, I'm not suppressing my humanity. I'm surrendering it. <laughs> Lord, I, I can't run with this. I, I, I can't run with these attractions. I, I can't run with this unforgiveness. I can't run with this raggediness, Lord, that's wrapped up in this flesh. I got to lay it aside. The way I talk to people, Lord, is raggedy. The way I deal with my anger is raggedy. My perspective on life is raggedy. God, I need to make a shift. Um, you can't get healed. Well, you won't acknowledge you need help. You got to make a shift. Yeah. Lastly, if you're winded, you're trying to get your second win. You do it by making an exchange. I, I like that Isaiah doesn't leave us lost in the limitations of our humanity. But he offers this hope where your human strength fails. God's inexhaustible strength prevails. It's good news. He says in verse 28 that God does not grow faint or grow weary. He's the God of the marathon. God never has to say, pause, call, call a time out. God, God never needs a break. He never reaches for an inhaler. He never sends you ahead saying, hold up, I got to catch my breath. He never has to rest or recharge or re refuel. He's, he's just strong like that. But the thing I love about his strength most of all is that he doesn't keep it to himself. It's shareable. Um, he, verse 29 says, he gives power to the faith and he strengthens the powerless. But notice what the text does not say. The text does not say he gives strength to everybody. Text says he gives strength to those who identify as powerless and faint. Now I understand why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, if God's power is made strong in my weakness, then I'll boast all the more gladly. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's cause he found out that the acknowledgement of our weakness in God's sight is the very thing that makes us eligible to receive the gift of his strength. Isaiah says these are the ones whose strength will be renewed. Uh, that, that word renewed is, is, it comes from a Hebrew word, uh, yalapu, but a better translation is to replace or exchange. And so it reads, those who are weak can make, will have their, will be able to make an exchange. I told you in the beginning about the phenomenon of the second wind. But what I didn't tell you was that scientists can't figure out when and how it happens. Some say it happens when oxygen starts to do a dance with the muscles. Some say it happens when endorphins start to kick in. Some say it, it happens all in your mind. I didn't come to debate science on this morning. 
But I do have some hope for the believer that the point of exchange happens when you acknowledge you need some help. The second wind happens at the point of divine exchange. It happens when I acknowledge that I can't run this race by myself. I can't raise these children by myself. Uh, I can't do this marriage thing by myself. Uh, I can't lead this family by myself. Uh, but God, I need to make an exchange. My intellect won't cut it. I believe my gifting only goes so far. So Father, uh, I make an exchange. I believe that's why our forefathers and foremothers sang this song with such great passion and conviction. I hear the deacon say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. And they say, no other, no other help do I know. That's because they understood that there's a transfer of power when divinity reaches humanity. And that's why they went on to sing the next part. If thou withdraw thy hand from me, tell me whether, where would I go? I came to tell y'all that God is still in the exchange business. That God is still making exchanges. Whatever you bring him, I promise he'll exchange it for better. If you're weary, wounded, and sad, you can go to him and make an exchange. Rest for your weariness, uh, healing for your woundedness, uh, joy for your sadness, uh, life for your hopelessness, uh, strength for your weaknesses, uh, peace for your brokenness. Uh, is there anybody uh, who needs to make an exchange? Uh, I came to tell you uh, that there's a second wind available for you. Uh, I know that you're tired. Uh, I feel you in my spirit. Uh, I know that you're worn out. Uh, I feel you in my spirit. Uh, I know that things didn't turn out the way uh, that you hoped they would. Uh, I feel you in my spirit. Uh, but I also feel in the spirit uh, that there's a second wind to be taken. Uh, I feel in my spirit uh, that God's about to drop what you need uh, so that you can keep on going, uh, so you can keep on running, uh, so you can keep on parenting, uh, so you can keep on praying, uh, so you can keep on ministering. Uh, come on if you need him uh, and you ain't ashamed to say it. Uh, why don't don't you lift your hands to our God and say, Father, I need the oh, I need thee every hour. God, I need you. Oh, Lord, can't make it without you. Can't do it without you. I tried it on my own. My own ain't good enough. I tried to think it out on my own. My wisdom ain't good enough. I tried to do it on my own. My strength ain't good enough. But Father, I heard that your power never runs out. I heard that your arm is not too short to reach me where I Lord, help me love my enemies, God. 
an anointing in the house. Your neighbor might not look it, but somebody came in the house on today ready to give up. Tired from fighting. But the Lord says there's an anointing in the house for a second wind. And if you're in need right now, if you're in need of strength, if you're in need of power, if you feel depleted in your spirit, we're going to open up the altar for salvation, but I feel in my spirit that the altar needs to be open for you to, to come and lay it down, for you to come and make an exchange. So if that's you, if, if that's you and you need to make an exchange at the altar, come on, come on down, come on. Come on down and, and, and make your exchange. Make your exchange. Come on, lay your burdens down. There's, there's freedom at the altar. There's freedom at the altar. God's going to revive you. God's going to strengthen you. God's going to restore you. Come on, come on, come on. Don't worry about your neighbor. They don't need what you need. They don't... They're human just like you're human. Come and lay it down. Come and lay it down. Come and lay it down. God says there's strength for you at the altar. There's strength. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. I, I know it feels heavy, but he says you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Come on, there's an anointing at the altar. Or perhaps you're in need of salvation. You can't receive the gift of strength without receiving the strength giver. If you're unsaved in this house, I came to tell you that God has strength for you. He has what you need. And one of the reasons why you may be depleted is because you don't have him. If you haven't said yes to Jesus as your personal savior, come on down, we'll, come on down, come on down, we'll, we'll walk with you, we'll walk with you, we'll invite you into that relationship. Perhaps you, you don't have a church home and, and you need to be connected to some some strong people to encourage your faith. This is a good place to be. Our pastor would be happy to have you. You can come on down. You can come on down. The altar is open. Whatever the issue is, there's strength for you. If it's sadness, there's strength for you. If it's hopelessness, there's strength for you. If you don't feel like you can make it until tomorrow, there's strength for you. If there's sickness, there's strength for you here. Come on, be restored. Come on, be restored. Be part of those. Be part of those that wait on the Lord. Can, can you extend your hands down to these who are at the altar?
Father, we don't know what they stand in need of. But we know you're strong enough to do it. God, we know that there is nothing that is too hard for you, God. There's no cancer you can't heal. There's no tumor you can't shrink. There's no relationship you can't put back together. There's no soul that's so lost that you can't reclaim them. God, there's no bill that's so big that you can't pay. There's no diagnosis, no situation that you can't deliver from. God, you are able. You are able to do exceedingly. You are able to do abundantly above all we could ever hope, ask, or think. We thank you, God, that there is none like you. And so today, God, we pray for these who are at the altar, God. Some of them, they were considering throwing in the towel. They were considering giving up. But God, we thank you that in your presence, God, there is strength. There's strength to keep going. There's strength to keep pushing. There's strength to keep moving. So God, we pray for a fresh anointing to fall fresh on these your people. God, we declare that they will not faint, that they will not quit, that they will not collapse, that they will not break. We declare strength in their minds and strength in their bones and strength in their bodies and strength in their hearts, God. We declare in the name of Jesus, God, that they will see the end that you've spoken from the beginning. We thank you, God, that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what it is that you have in store for their lives. And we thank you for the promise that says our latter days shall be greater than our former. God, our latter days shall be greater than our former. Their latter days shall be greater than their former. We thank you, God, that they haven't seen their last bright day, that they haven't seen their last good day, that they haven't laughed their last laugh, that they haven't smiled their last smile, that there is joy on the other side of what they're going through. And we thank you, God, that even in the valley you walk with us. And that, God, even now, you are equipping you are renewing and you are reviving. We pray for revival in their souls. We pray for revival in their spirit. That what their struggle has stripped them of, that you will replenish it. And we thank you that your strength is an everlasting strength. We thank you your joy is an everlasting joy. We thank you that your peace surpasses understanding and that they shall run on to the finish line to see the end that you've already decreed from the beginning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now somebody come on, lift up. Would you just lift up a praise? Not for you, but for them. Come on, lift up a praise because their best days aren't behind them, but their best days are still ahead. Spirit of God and how God had moved in this place. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Let's thank God for the preacher. 
how God moved. I pray, I pray you were strengthened on today. The invitation was extended, but I, for anyone, if you're here and you want to join the church or you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, at the end of service, our ministers will be up to the front to receive you. Feel free to come down. As a reminder, before we go out, Pastor is again in Revival at Monument of Faith in Durham. And he would love to see you there Monday through Wednesday at 7 p.m. Let us look to the God of our strength. God, we thank you that you are the source of our strength. God, we praise you that you are the strength of our life. And so now, God, as we leave this place, bid us that we never leave your presence. Ask, God, that you would strengthen us as we go, that we will walk in the strength of your power, that we will walk in the strength of your truth, that we will stand on the strength of your promise, that heaven and earth will pass away before your word returns to you void. Thank you for your strength to run on. Thank you for your strength to keep keeping on. Thank you for your strength to keep going on. It's in the mighty and majestic and matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen, amen, 